about the local economy, local business. Uh, one thing I, I just wanted to add really quickly is the importance of local businesses, especially the locally owned and operated businesses. And if you look on the sheet here, what's known as the multiplier effect, they've done a lot of research that shows that shopping in locally owned and operated businesses has at least three times the economic impact that shopping in chain stores. So Democrats, I think, are known for education, we're known for health care, we're known for compassion, but we're also known for local business as well. So that's what we want to show people uh, tomorrow. So without further ado, I want to ask uh, our three guest speakers, I gave them some questions. Um, if you could, just for folks who aren't familiar, if you could kind of describe, I'm going to play the role of Johnny Carson here, by the way. Uh, if you could describe kind of your organizations, what your organizations do, and also your role within the organization. I'm so, so uh, honored that Tom asked me to, to be with you today. Uh, my name is Verna Ballard. I'm, I'm with the Dallas Austin Lounge Chamber of Commerce. I have been, gosh, uh, starting as Vice President for Economic Development back when the Industrial Party of the Chamber and uh, been there for 20 years Our chamber is uh, 1,300 plus uh, members. Most of those members are businesses. 86% of our members are small businesses, meaning they have 10 or fewer employees. So, uh, A to the Lowndes County Democratic Party for uh, supporting local business. We, we kind of put that under an umbrella of, of uh, think big, and we have uh, two things that we think about that. Number one is, I am Greater Valdosta because, as just as Tom said, it really does make a difference. And it's not only uh, your local businesses that are locally owned, uh, but shopping those big boxes too because it helps us as well. The, the thing we don't want to do is to, is to drive people to the internet where we get zero benefit from, uh, from the uh, sales that are made on the internet. The other part of Think Big is, well, just that. Uh, we want uh, to encourage our community to think big, to be big thinkers and to be very entrepreneurial in nature. We want our community to have well, uh, well educated um, elected officials, people who know what the issues are in the community and who have the uh, enthusiasm and the drive to actually change the things that need to be changed in our community so that we can build a stronger local economy. Our chamber, we, we call it the ABCs of the chamber, and that's what we do is we advocate which is a strong, strong government affairs approach. In fact, we just, uh, I just got an email from Amy Carter. We, we have a very strong stand on, on transportation funding, and we keep on hammering that with our local delegation, and it has a lot to do with what you brought up. We don't want to be sending money to Atlanta that does not come back to the local area. I, I think we would support additional tax taxing in some way. If we know that that transportation money is coming back to repair our roads and bridges, which are becoming a serious health and safety issue now, and help us keep growing for the new businesses that uh, Andrew is trying to recruit from outside of the local market. So we advocate. We also build this community with a very pro-business environment. And that's not an easy thing. It doesn't just automatically happen. It takes uh, vigilance and hard work. We connect. Uh, that's this ABC. We connect our chamber members with uh, potential customers and clients so that they can help build their businesses and be stronger and more prosperous. And we help promote our members, our community, and, uh, and, and our member businesses. So uh, that's kind of the ABCs of the chamber. Well, I'm Bahas Down, CEO of Azalea Health. Uh, we're a health IT company, uh, which means we do software for physician offices. I'm really honored to be here to see you all. I traditionally have only my best five friends uh, that I know is the only Democrats in town. So I know that I have more friends to know. Yeah. So um, at Azalea Health, we're a company that started in 2008 with uh, three founders, and now we have about 65 employees. Uh, and basically, we do software for physician offices from the moment call your physician to schedule an appointment. You, they use our software to schedule you in their calendar. 
and when you come and visit the physician, and our software takes care of your claim that goes to the insurance company all the way to sending you an invoice. I'm sorry about that. Uh, and we also uh, allow the physicians to document the physician-patient encounter. And it helps the physician, and actually we, we run what I would call algorithms to make sure the physician doesn't over-prescribe if the, the weight of the patient uh, uh, is too small so they don't overdose them. And we help them with medication, allergies, and things like that. So, so we're actually not only doing the financial piece, helping the physician be financially sound, we also make them clinically better as well. Uh, <clears throat> Now Azalea Health has been, uh, so we started hearing about us, uh, the chamber actually uh, helped us out at the, the beginning uh, very much. We were the winners of the business plan competition, so I would educate <coughs> that. Uh, it did actually allow us to quit our jobs and start the company. And it gave us the legitimacy to talk to bankers and shape our messaging and our business plan. And since then, actually, recently in the middle of last year, we acquired a company in Atlanta. And unfortunately, I live most, somewhat in Atlanta and I still have, yeah, I still have both. So I, I came here uh, because I am, I live in Boston for 15 years. It's my home. Uh, <coughs> that's the longest place I've ever lived in. And my mom is here. Thank you. Uh, and both my mom. Uh, so, um, and what we, what, uh, Azalea Health has brought in uh, a lot of tech jobs and or high paying weight jobs. Uh, traditional positions that we have in the company is uh, programmers, uh, trainers and software support. Uh, we have billing analysts and revenue cycle managers. And if we look at the healthcare industry, Another way to lower that cost is with automation. Uh, and what we mean by that is uh, saving and duplicate tests. Uh, how many of us go to the physician and when, when you do a bunch of tests and then they refer you to a specialist and they do the same test again. Those are just an, an extra few thousand dollars in your bill that eventually go to Medicare, Medicaid, or your private, private insurance. And with digital information, it'll allow us to be able to see that information without really going again and taking a lab test again. And uh, gives an in, a better insight to, to the patient information. Also, another thing that we do, which we advocate for tremendously as any health, is the patient education level. Uh, we believe a way to save costs and lower costs of healthcare is when consumers of healthcare, us, the, you know, the patients, when we actually understand our problems and how we can solve them. And a lot of times, healthcare treats the patient where they give you many things to do, but no logical way to understand it. And what we're trying to do is engage the patient with their healthcare. So we have a patient portal to allow them to go in and be able to see their lab results. They can understand not only their lab results and their different values and if they're within the range and outside of the range, but be able to go online and read more about it. And we will facilitate ways for them to understand and reconcile medications. Average American uh, at 65 or above has about 20 prescription drugs. So we, uh, <coughs> yeah. Uh, so I want to talk about any, you know, but traditionally we got a lot of drugs that we <laughs> I actually seen charts where there's people with 50 or 60 uh, different <coughs> medications. So we allow them to understand the contraindications between those drugs uh, and also be able to understand, and, and their caregivers also be able to understand what they're taking. 
Uh, Azalea Health now has, um, since, since we're in a very thriving <coughs> industry, and it's a new, fairly new industry, health IT is not very well. It's just the product health records and the product medical records are just the thing um, We're fortunate enough, we feel that there's a lot of opportunities here. We work with Boston State University and Margaret State University College to make sure <coughs> we have the course that we need for our future growth. Uh, our sales and uh, marketing team in Atlanta is growing the company tremendously, but the work is done here in Boston. You know, the, the, the labor, the programming, the intelligence, the customer care is actually done right here in Boston. So we continue to advocate for the better education. And downtown Boston. We're right in the uh, above the but we're in downtown. I am the executive director of the Valdez Delounds County Development Authority, and basically our mission is to create an environment to allow for our existing industries to grow and expand and retain those jobs here, um, but also to recruit new industries that fit into our target market that we have. Um, and we like to take a three-pronged approach to economic development. And that's basically small business entrepreneur development, which Myrna is excellent at and has wonderful programs and the resources to really support those businesses, but our existing industries, as well as the recruitment of them. And our existing industries, we do a lot with them because 80% of new jobs that are created in a community come through your existing industries. So I would tell you, last year, we had 700 jobs created in our community for our existing industries. Um, so we make a huge investment into them when we recruit them to come to our community, and we want to make sure that we as a community see that return on investment in our tax dollars by seeing them grow and add more jobs. Um, so that's what we do at the Development Authority. We have um, eight industrial parks that we also manage. So we have three that have available property right now. That's Westside Business Park, uh, Miller Business Park, and Bassford Business Park, which is more for a heavy industrial type use. Um, we kind of are your marketing arm to the outside world. So we work to market to outside companies looking for places to relocate and places to do new business. We market the fact that we have tons of water that is extremely affordable. We are not experiencing any droughts, last time, especially my backyard. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> and the stormwater retent detention pond that is outside my office is quite full. We're thinking of putting some fish in. But, um, so we have that uh, that we work on. We also focus on the fact that we do have a good population um, here of available people that can go work. We talk about Moody Air Force Base and those people that are retiring from Moody Air Force Base. We promote Valdosta State University as well as Wiregrass Technical College and the wonderful things that they're both doing, especially dual enrollment that we have in our high schools right now so that um, students can now um, go into a technical college or into the university pre-qualified for a certain field that they're wanting to look, you know, go into. Uh, we promote that heavily because then we can help funnel those students into positions that are available in our existing industries or for new industries looking to come. So we promote a healthy, vibrant workforce, a very loyal workforce. We promote our location from a logistics distribution standpoint and also the health care that we do have um, here in our area that's so important to quality of life and making sure that we can take care of your workforce when we bring them here. Um, so that's kind of what we do in a nutshell. And, um, okay, so you mentioned marketing. So when, are you talking about trade magazines for primarily, or like how, what, how, what kind of marketing do you do? So actually the number one marketing tool that we have is our website. So we're actually being looked at and considered before we even know that we're being looked at and considered. And so the way that I would describe economic development and companies that are looking is very much a funnel approach. And we start off up here with about 100 different places, and everybody's looking for demographics, they're checking your graduation rates, they're checking your education attainment, checking um, 
your population, your po checking um, unemployment, several different aspects that they're looking at, looking at water, power, natural gas, um, land availability, and building availability. And all we want to do is stay, we want to stay through that funnel. So we want to continue working our way down to where we make it to the bottom. And um, once we get to the bottom, then we're hoping for those companies to come and visit. So from a marketing standpoint, the website is one of our number one tools that we utilize. Um, we do some trade magazines, like we'll advertise our theme as we're building a groundbreaking community because we do have industrial parks that have a lot of um, sites that are ready to build upon. So we focus on that, building a groundbreaking community. Um, we do a lot of marketing trips. So if I'm in town, I shouldn't really be here. I should be out. So um, I travel and meet with location advisors that are people who talk to companies about where they need to locate. And then I'm also traveling to meet with companies and um, also work with our state allies. And our state allies are the Georgia Department of Economic Development, it's the Georgia Power, the Georgia EMC, MEI, Norfolk Southern, CSX, Atlanta Gas and Light, and making sure that I maintain those relationships with our allies, the Georgia Ports Authority, all of them, so that when we need things, we can pick up the phone <coughs> and that they know that they have a friend in Valdosta and that we can um, grow and bring business here for that type of thing. Okay, so a follow-up question. So if, if there's a company thinking about relocating or starting a business, there's other places they could, other states where they could put their business. You, do you market us as a, a low tax? I mean, low taxes are nice, but you also want to have the infrastructure there. But what are the businesses looking for? I mean, what, what are you selling? I mean, we have a highly educated workforce with Moody and BSU and whatever else. So it really depends on the industry sector and what we're um, really the sales pitch that I would say we would give. So we worked with a company, a prospect visit that we had today, which his number one driver is logistics and moving trucks and transportation. Um, not so much the incentives or um, workforce, but logistics co uh, connectivity, um, companies that can supply him with services, which we have an abundance of. So we keep a track of different companies and what all their skill sets are. So for instance, we know that we have over 40 companies that work in the logistics distribution industry that can service that sector. And so what he's trying to make sure is that he can, that he has companies he can call on to provide trucking services, that he has a workforce that can drive the product, that he has um, somebody that can service the trucks, um, and obviously this is a huge truck user, this is a, a, a manufacturer, but somebody that can make this product. Um, if it's somebody like Baja that we're working with, then we're going to work very strongly with Valdosta um, State University and Wiregrass Technical College to make sure that we have that highly educated skill set that he's looking for. And not just that, but we also have to have product. So if you don't have product, you don't get the business. So, I mean, quite frankly, if they don't have a building to go into or they don't have land or you don't have a site, then they're looking at the next community. So the company that we visited with today has five different communities he's looking at today in three different states. So um, we'll work very hard to make sure and to show him the competitiveness that we have, and we'll go above and beyond to show the cost of doing business here in Boston, as opposed to the other locations. I hope that answers your question. Uh, so another question, uh, in terms of uh, jobs in the local economy, all, anybody, uh, where would you say Lyons has been in the past? Where are we right now? And where do you see us in the future, five, ten years from now? Well, um, you know, I think we can tell you pretty precisely because we do, that's what we do. You know, this is what Andrea and I think about every day. About five years ago, we contracted, the chamber contracted with the uh, Valdosta State University College of Business, and we asked a couple of economists to help us get a feel for, you know, relatively speaking, how are we doing in terms of our community's economic health. And the College of Business Administration, um, a couple of economists, selected 14 peer communities that, that we could track over the years and compare ourselves with. Uh, communities that are about our same population size and have some of the same types of amenities, some of the same types of challenges 
and we've been tracking those 15 communities ourselves, being in the group, over the last few years. Um, of the 15, you know, there, are, there are 11 different measures on community economic health that we look at, that our economists look at every year. And to be very honest, we, we look great in some areas, but overall, um, we, we've been ranking 11 or 12 out of the 15 communities. Uh, on those very, very quantifiable, comparable measures of community economic health. Some people get a little bit depressed about that. Uh, I, not I, because I, I tell you what, uh, when you look at our community, compared with the number one community on that list, which is Bowling Green, Kentucky, which is where I got my bachelor's degree at Western Kentucky University, so I know Bowling Green. We have way more to work with than Bowling Green does. We have all of the resources and assets to be virtually anything we decide we want to be. Uh, so I'm not at all um, concerned about that uh, because I know we have what it takes in raw material and, and people resources to build a great and even better community than we have right now. Uh, but that's what some, some of the things that Andrea and Baha and I work on all the time is how do we how do we muster the energy and the enthusiasm and the center to create that synergy to make great things happen in Dallas and Dallas County. We're working on a subcommittee uh, with the <coughs> president, Bill McKinney, to, uh, to, target, to look at targeted business clusters and to think about what are the things that could be made, that we could work on and build in our community, what types of businesses, what kinds of jobs <coughs> can we throw here or recruit here that can help us use our best and brightest, our 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 Tech grads, our VSU grads, uh, keep those folks here after they finish their their education. And uh, we we're, we're looking at these business clusters, logistics, as Andrea mentioned, which almost always means bringing in wealth and, and new business from uh, recruiting from outside the, the local economy. We're looking at information technology and medical services and support businesses. Well, Azalea Health is a poster child. I mean, this is a, a business that has the potential to be a, a, an actual gazelle. We're looking at agriculture and environmental <coughs> technology. Uh, so we're, we, we're focused uh, on those things that we think and that economists think we have a great deal of potential to, uh, to, to, to grow and to, to improve our local economy. And it won't surprise me at all as we make progress with these targeted business clusters that we start seeing ourselves rise from number 12, number 11, all the way up that list. Because again, the resources we have are, are greater than the number one community on that list, Bowling Green, Kentucky. So I, I'm not, I'm not discouraged. I've got, I've got 20 years left to work on this. Another 20 years. <laughs> Actually, to give you a little uh, perception of what we do. So we do software in our competition. Our biggest competitor is a publicly traded company in Boston, the Lexus, or the Silicon Valley. I mean, the Silicon Valley, the area in California. And with information technology and... Can you speak a little louder? I'm oh, sorry. <clears throat> so what I'm saying is our largest competitors are... Uh, Company in Boston, the publicly traded companies, two plus two and a half billion dollars in uh, asset values, and another one is in Silicon Valley. Man. I mean, in the Silicon Valley. Uh, <clears throat> but what I'm saying, there is potential with information technology for a community to be able to create jobs and products that they are completely from an area that is really not commonly doing that kind of stuff. Uh, yes. I'm sorry, Bob, I have to ask this question because I've been hearing so much on the radio about connectivity yeah. and like how Chattanooga is just shooting through the roof with jobs because they've got this great yeah. connectivity because the city made a decision to do that. Don't you think that's something that it's, we should be working excellent. on here? Yes, and this is one of the reasons that actually I can tell you right now is they help outsource them, the outsources close to $25,000 a month to Houston, Texas, because we have, they have the connectivity there. We don't have it. Wow. 
So is someone working on it? Are you guys working on that with the city to check? But we could get one of those grants and be one of the leading cities in Malvasta if we would get that. But Chattanooga can do what we can do, and there's no reason. I, I think we might have missed the boat, the grant to vote. Um, is that the way you see it? And of course, TBA was in Chattanooga. Those were some special um, But what we do have is we try to take a look at what we currently have in the infrastructure, um, from the infrastructure that's available to us right now. And many of you may not have heard, but we have what's called Tower Cloud, and that is a fiber optic network that is available to us that's here in our community. And for many years, they've been running fiber optic along railroads, and we have that infrastructure here that we can provide the industries. So um, we try to reach out and think outside of the box, because that's one of the things we have to do, is think outside of the box and um, come up with creative ways to do things. And um, Tower Cloud has provided us the opportunity to provide anybody, any industry, with whatever amount of um, capability that they need for <coughs> a broadband capacity. But also having it uh, to the home where our future generations, that they are the, the three years old, the homes that they don't have the internet at all, those are my future employees or future uh, developers for Isaiah to help, and if they do not have affordable mm -hmm. accessible internet, it's a big problem. And, you know, so we, we do need to get it to a level where it's at home and affordable. Google just signed with the city of Atlanta to uh, offer fiber across Atlanta or some cities mm -hmm. within Atlanta and North Atlanta and, and, and downtown Atlanta. And Atlanta has a lot of bandwidth, and there's a lot of competitors that provide good internet. But Google realizes their future consumers, their future employees, their future uh, users of their platform need higher bandwidth, and they're going to offer 100 meg connectivity at a very, very affordable way. So if we look in the future, how entertainment and TV is going to be delivered, it's going to be delivered on internet. Or a technical college, you don't have to have a four-year degree, don't pull out your hands at that. 
but you, you have to have some type of skill set because every job that you're going to look for in the future is going to have to have it. And um, whether it's welding, whether it's uh, PLC, we're having a hard time buying PLC, people that can program computers to the automation that can work together and make the data transfer. We need those jobs, if, even in our community today. Um, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The question is, how is our community providing the, that education to our students? And I tell you, I'm very pleased to know that Pineville, uh, Pineville um, has the Lego support um, that supports STEM. So what it encourages is students in the elementary stage to learn how to think towards technology, to think towards engineering, and to think towards <coughs> mathematics through the Lego process. And um, those are the types of programs that companies are looking for in your community to answer those questions. It's also having a workforce that wants to go to work. So a workforce that wants to go to work and wants to better themselves. And that's the other key question that we get asked. So um, those are what is asked of us from our existing industry, and that is what's asked of us of industries looking for. And I agree with Andrea. There's there's nothing that's going to be a more important determinant of our community's future success than than our labor force and our education system is 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 directly uh, involved in that. And you know, there I don't think it I don't think it's healthy for us to pretend that we don't have some serious challenges with our graduation rates. Um, you know, I wish. I wish saying it was uh, that everything's fine would really make it fine, but that's that's really I think the, the first step for us is to uh, to understand that we as a community need to do better. I want I want us to do better. Um, uh, we're very encouraged by Centella Charter Academy. Uh, we think that, that that has a tremendous uh, potential for helping us to to uh, to concentrate on a small group of children and that that might not have. Uh, opportunities as others and to uh, really uh, excel in that way. Uh, it probably would change our problem because uh, I should have been there. It's about uh, you mentioned about the new development coming into Alcosta with the park, uh, uh, industrial park. If you look at pre-existing areas that are, are underused, a lot of land that's just sitting there for years, i.e. the flower bakery out there on Forest Street has sit out there. I've that one all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a great location for the Dallasta Library that they were going to move to five points. That would be perfect for that area to develop that area. The under undertaking of the south side going across the bridge. Okay, we don't talk about it. We talk about North Dallasta. Growing downtown. Plus growing. Because for some reason, it seems like a lot of places are closing. A lot of the shops are closing up. Although, what's causing that? It seems to me it was. I'm like, this is a nice downtown. Yeah, actually, I think we probably have more projects going in downtown Valdosta than we have had in quite some time. They, they're not very visible right now, but uh, it's really. I, I, I've got a tremendous level of, of, in, of uh, um, positive attitude about what's going. I like that a lot. I mean, the downtown right. is, but right. it just seems like lately there's been a lot of yes. low signs. Right. There's some shifting around going on. And, but back to the old bakery place out there. So I worked really hard on that building. <laughs> and it's going to be a long time. But we can only control people. We can't control circumstances. All right, so let me say this. There are circumstances outside of our control there. We don't own the building. So there's a person that sits in Canada that owns the business. And my hands are tied when it comes to that. Um, as much as we, we continue, we market, we market, we use it. Um, but until that owner of that facility wants to do something different with it, I, I really, the North Industrial Authority and the community's hands are tied until that owner breaks out of his shell. Um, and decides that he wants to do something else with it. So, so, yeah, um, first of all, I like, you know, like you guys can buy all so, you know, how you can annoy them. But the thing is that you say that you're trying to uh, 
establish jobs, and you know the people of low income, they don't have no transportation, even though they have the qualifications, you know, they have the uh, qualifications and everything. But they don't have no transportation. You know, I see, um, you know, blocks here. You know, you got bus uh, benches, but you don't have no bus. <laughs> 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 you know, no bus is I mean, you know, there's people that have low no income that do need oh, that chance of, 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 you know, prospering. So, you know, where is that coming from? Yes, sir. You know, the city of Valdosta did a very thorough study. Uh, how long ago is that? About 15 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been a while, hasn't it, J.B., yeah. to determine whether we were, whether we had the demand for public transit mm -hmm. and whether we could pay for it. And the answer they came back with, and J.B. helped me with this, first, the answer to the first was, yeah, yes, there is the demand for public transportation. Number two, can we afford it? And the answer was, no, that it would lose money for us. One of the problems that, that, that's going on now with Valdosta to be a metro, we lose over a million dollars a year in public transportation because we don't have a transportation system. Last year, money went to Athens because we didn't have it in place. And what amazes me that Hinesville, Georgia, which is half the size of Valdosta, Yes. Yes. I, mean, I think I think uh, uh, I think about also the posture more with that transportation mm -hmm. because you have that high income people and you have that low income people collaborating together <coughs> and you're to unify about also. I mean, you know, I agree with you. I agree with you. It's, it's a very, very important, very important you know, and looking at uh, what we call a generation, mm -hmm. they don't look to buy cars. This is That's right. Last year, the first year in record that there were more bicycles and then public transportation that have been used versus regular cars. So, uh, future employees of Azalea, they don't own a car, and we're going to have a problem with this. So, they would like a green bus. I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. I've been here for about eight or nine months. And, um, Katie, back when I was in my I kind of feel like uh, the need where I came to move here to, I feel like part of it is like, I don't think uh, Valdosta downtown is welcoming. Um, it's very boring. Um, I'm a younger person. I'm in my 30s, but I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, sure you know, I, it's, I have a lot of ideas, probably because where I came from. And um, living in Minnesota all my life, um, there's there's definitely ways. Even with the healthcare system, it's it's terrible being a mom using Medicaid and coming here and being used to a HMO system or whatever we use. And I have to take my kid. I don't know where to bring my kids for healthcare here using Medicaid. One of my daughter's special needs, so it's like every door that I've um, tried to knock on for health care, they're like, we don't accept that. You have to find somebody else. And um, if you had somebody, 10 more of me to go in these neighborhoods, far as off of West Hill Avenue, off of Northside Drive, and try to get them to vote in a fun way to do it, and something that can um, appeal to them, make them come out, you know what I'm saying? And I don't. I think a lot of them feel like they don't believe in second chances here. Well, you know the state, saying? the state of Georgia is facing a big challenge. We're not. We're being hard-headed and not expanding Medicaid. And right. It's hurting right. a lot of people. That's right. And it's unfortunate because that's six hundred thousand people that should be well covered by insurance. For selfish reasons, I would want that. But it's for a human reasons I would want that as well. So we, as a state, we're, we're in trouble with that side. Of course going to have also penalties on top of that because the federal government can penalize the states who did not but opt to expand Medicaid. Mm -hmm. So we're going to find actually hospital cuts. So our local hospital is going to have a lot of trouble down the road and physicians because of that decision. It was a one-man decision, now it's a many-men decision, but all of it is none. So I don't know what to say. So then it helps the people get on the city council. I don't answer. think it's beyond. It, it used to be like a governor issue, a governor mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. It's not. Oh, okay, okay. Let's
I think Jim had a question about transportation. Yeah, getting back to the transportation thing, uh, a couple of years ago when I took the Government 101 class, and I talked to Larry Hansen specifically about the transportation thing, and one of the re the main reason that it got turned down was it needed a million dollars a year. Now that may sound like a lot of money, but it was a one mil increase in our taxes that would fund that. Now a mill is what, 60 bucks a year to an individual property owner? Uh, hardly next to nothing, you know. We're talking, what, a buck a week? <laughs> and, and, and at the same time, Valdosta had the lowest millage rate, tax rate, in the state. And for every city that was of comparable size to us, it would have, you know, places like Savannah have a 12 mil rate. Uh, you know, another place about twice as much as we do. So that's all it would have taken was a one mil increase in property taxes to fund that million dollars and have a transportation study. Like the man says, a lot of millennials are choosing not to own a car, using that, you know, choosing not to have that expense because uh, the alternative, the way we have to do it right now, is everyone must own a car. Right. We have to own a car. That's the that's the flip side of the the whole not having a transportation system results in, and I think that's unfair to a lot of people that can't afford it right now, working their way up or whatever. You know, but what we need to do is we need to link up the neighborhoods to the working areas. Is that also a big complaint from employers when employees don't have reliable transportation? They miss work. I would like to say something. Um, I was concerned about um, transportation also. We call ourselves Valosta Metropolitan Area. That's true. Which Lowndes County is the county. And if this money was to come about for transportation, would it just serve? Valdosta instead of the county where the taxpayers are paying money. You know, like you say, taxes. I wouldn't want to pay extra taxes if the county could not have any transportation for elderly people. People cannot get to and from or they're too old to drive and don't have anyone. There is nothing where you have service to bring people in and out. If they don't have Medicaid, they cannot get a, well, in New York it's called accessorize. You know, I mean, I'm from up north too. But I've been in Valdosta for 22 years, and I have not seen Valdosta grow very much in 22 years. So, you know, so. I, I studied the Liberty County transit system over in Hinesville. And what, what Hinesville does, they serve the city of Hinesville and Fort Stewart. And there are other municipalities in the in the uh, in Liberty County. So every incorporated area of Liberty County, a bus go. The unincorporated area, no. But say Val Valdosta did, they would service Haydara, Dasher, Lake Park, and Valdosta. They wouldn't service every. They wouldn't set, um, service like Clydeville. Uh, no, Clydeville. Uh, I don't know if Clydeville incorporated. I think it's unincorporated. Mm -hmm. It, uh, wait, that's the way Liberty County does. But you can mm -hmm. do what you want. But mm -hmm. uh, when I studied the Liberty County system, if you were incorporated city inside, inside of Liberty County, you had bus system provided to you, including uh, Fort Stewart. All of it sounds good. All I'm saying is, as a taxpayer and as a homeowner, I wouldn't want to contribute another dime if they weren't doing anything in the county, if everything was just for the city. Well, it's going to be virtually impossible to serve the whole county. Well, you know. Uh -huh. Like I said, you got to start they, need, they have to start somewhere. I think this should be your platform and we'll be behind you. I think I'll hear my campaign speech already. Yes, uh, I kind of remember when I first moved here that there was a, a, discussion, a discussion going on about a public transportation system that was supposed to be coming in by the year 2012. <laughs> Somehow it never got off the ground. Eh? Yes. All of a sudden it disappeared. What I wanted to say um, is I know like in 2000, year 2000, 2005, an awful lot of funds came into the state of Georgia for the transportation system. 
90% of it went to Atlanta for that big metro system that they redeveloped, uh, made more modern. Very little of it went out to the small communities in Georgia who actually needed the transportation systems because having a better transportation system naturally is going to attract more jobs to the area. And they, they attract jobs and the people have a way to get to the jobs and that's making the small areas progress. But what I wanted to point out is um, very often when I talk to people about it, they seem to lean more towards private industry coming in and starting the company, opposed to the state or the federal government or any other entity getting putting the money in up for the, for the transportation system. But I wanted to point out that there is a, a procedure called the Certificate of Need, isn't it? Yes, they also have a certificate yes, of need. I mean, they have a need, and they need to consider making it out of certificate of need, sending it to Washington, and explaining to Washington how almost all the funds that come into this area for transportation get hogged up by the larger cities like Atlanta, and the governor do never does anything. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe um, if you can get together and get uh, people's heads together, they can find out how to file that certificate of need. Yes. Amen. Y'all, he, he does something. He gave all these staff a raise. But I want to just say one thing that I've been talking to some people about the uh, transportation too. And I understand we did have the money. We have done studies for transportation here in Valdosta too. They have the money, and I understand there is some money for studies. The problem is maintaining the transportation when you get it. I tried to uh, ask about what are some possibilities that they look at other cities and so forth. One of the things is. Like this young lady was saying, a lot of taxpayers do not want to pay an extra tax to maintain That's it true. if it's mm -hmm. not going to service their area. That's true. So that is one reason they're saying they're having a hard time getting transportation in the city of Valdosta, which is really neat. It is the way to maintain it once you get it. We can get the transportation started, but how can we maintain it? How can we keep it going? Yeah. And that's but if we have that vision, I mean, BSU said the same thing about a $12 million parking deck, and now it's provided all these jobs and is growing and growing. And I think that if we don't put that vision in and see that and invest, yeah. and we're always worried about in the future, then it's right. really going to be well, I agree with you. And I have said at least two trial errors. I have tried to say, let's try a couple of trial periods with it and so forth. And just from what I understand, it has not. Uh, materialized yet. <laughs> but there has been let's at least try to see what would happen one way to it is something that I've been trying to work on and then you can do. So, you know, just give it an effort. If it don't work, it don't. But if it do, it's a safe start. I need to add something. I think the, the, the city of Alaska, or the county of Alaska County would lose a lot of money if private industry came in and took over the transportation mm -hmm. system. That I would like to, I would not vote for it. I would like to fight it if, if, if you know, there's something mm -hmm. yeah. for that. Prosper, prosper about also. Why yes. not give? 
What does it take to get it? What is the steps to get it? Make it happen. People gotta have a heart, first of all. There's a lot of selfish going on in America, period. Everybody's concerned about them and where they're gonna be. But it could create jobs and save lives, for sure. Um, most of these kids is felons, so I don't know how they're gonna have jobs in their industries <laughs> because there's no support to what they want to do. I have never seen, I haven't seen a parent at a bus stop since I've been here. Um, I don't see parents outside. I don't know where these kids go to or why. Um, it's, it's just got to be some more people that do work and pay taxes that got to take that stand and be like, I'm willing to take less to step to help these other people. You know what I'm saying? Just for a while until things could get better, but until then. Well, I, you know, I want to tell you something real quick. You know, in the last few months, there a lot of events in Atlanta. And Atlanta's number one problem is public transportation. So if you guys need some of that money, stop calling people with us. I think we as a people as well, also, I think we can collaborate and get yeah. the people done. Yeah. And the understanding of that transportation needed, we wouldn't really need, we could force them to do this. And, and our problem is a little tiny neighborhood about that. Yeah. You know, that's, it's, uh, I'm sorry. I really say that because I am one of them, and I push it for it, and just talking with the city council and the other city council, we, the citizens need to really push it. We need transportation. A lot of people in different districts, they feel they have their cars, so they don't push the issue. But to make the whole city, and to make the, and like I said, just, I guess as a group, it, uh, improve the whole entire city rather than just, uh, just certain districts, that's what you're going to have to do. Talk to your local officials. Push them. Push them. Tell them that's what we need. We need transportation. What I'll do in the next email, if I've got everybody's email, we'll send you contact information. Of course, you can find it on your own, but we'll send you contact information so that you can all email some of these folks. And maybe you can get some of your friends and family to email as well. Jade, I think Jade is. We're giving away a million dollars a year back to the state every year that they give us for public transportation. Because we don't have a system. So Carl and Ellis Black and Amy Carter and Dexter Shopper, their hands are tied. They're already giving us a million dollars that we don't use when we give back every year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we need to come up with something. I would, I would say that you know, what Council Mentally uh, is saying is absolutely correct. Um, we need to really reach out to you, your local elected officials and talk to them and educate them about what you want to see and the need that you have. Um, and really talk to not just part of the city of district, but to all of them, because they serve all of them. So, Felicity and the I'm a bus driver, and the lady said about the, uh, the, the parents don't come out to meet the bus drivers. A lot of it is our parents are lazy. I'm not, I'm not down at all the parents. <coughs> Some of our parents are just lazy. They, the bus pull up, and the parents take the kid out the door. And they inside with their honey or whatever they do. Yeah. So you can't put it all on that, that that the bus drivers or the city is not where the bus drivers are not going there and seeing about these kids. Sometimes the bus drivers go beyond where the parents are not even home. The bus drivers take them to the terminal and sit there with them so you can find a parent to come pick up the kids. So it's got to be, it's, it starts at the home. You can't put it all on the bus drivers or the school system. Teaching our kids start at home and until babies stop having babies you you're not gonna stop this and I just you know I just I think it's we can only go so the bus shot the parents gotta get out there when I was being raised up our mothers saw us get on the bus and our mother's home we got back off the bus now the mothers got most of the ones that want to work going to work 
because there are opportunities that they have the after school program. I'm just getting in from the after school program. We hire those kids from 6 o'clock in the morning to sometimes 7 or 8 o'clock at night. Of course, y'all are still out there fighting that traffic. But I do agree we need some city transportation because the, the, uh, it's congested and the bus drivers have a hard time on the 1st, the 15th, and the 30th getting those kids home <laughs> with this traffic. Let me just make a little announcement. Uh, this week, and I think it's Wednesday at the MPO, they do have their meeting. They are talking about transportation, what we can do. They have, they have the advisory committee and they have the policy making committee. And it meets this Wednesday, I believe. One that, let me get it right now. I think, well, they have one tomorrow, too, at 2.30. We need to show up to these meetings, get talk to them, get the inputs, because I've gone to some of the meetings and it's pretty much the same conversation that we have. A lot of people don't go. You go in and hear what they're saying and put, give me input. They have uh, surveys and everything going on and so forth. They're still going on now. But we got to get the people in the community to push a little bit more for it, and I think we can get it done. I really do. Yes. Um, almost every single uh, elected body and appointed body has during their meeting, not everyone, but almost everyone, a citizens to be heard section. Um, so if you were to go to the MPO's um, meeting, there may well be a section on their agenda for people to say what's on their mind. When you come to the Board of Elections here and you come to their meeting, the very first thing on their agenda after the pledge is citizens to be heard. So go to the place where they're talking about this, to the MPO or to the city council or the county commission. They have citizens to be heard. Go and be heard. Um, I don't know what Gretchen was saying. Uh, the MPO actually wants information of uh, what people want. Uh, Corey Hole is very accessible at the South Georgia Regional Development Commission. <coughs> Um, he even helped me with the school project, so you can call them, whatever. And whenever they have a project that they actually, part of their job, his job is to solicit information about public opinion. So, uh, yeah, they're very accessible, and he's very accessible. So don't be afraid to call or email or whatever, and he'll appreciate it. Well, and Corey has been our special speaker here at the party meeting the last two Augusts. And this last August, he did... Uh, an activity with us to find out what we wanted about transportation. So he is open to our opinion. If I can ask you a final wrap-up question. You mentioned uh, not shopping online as much to support what this. Any other final things we can do, not just as citizens, but local leaders in our communities? What can we do to kind of promote local business, help the local economy? Any other ideas, suggestions? Well, uh, what you already do is just get behind uh, some of the, the folks who are running for public office who are who understand the importance of the business community for helping uh, all of the community and creating those jobs, creating that wealth in the community that, that can, can trickle down and spread around. Yeah, I want to add, I think I, I, I have a political science uh, black woman, but I don't know I'm the number of reps in Thank you. So we only have five, so try to figure out how can we educate the other 160 spots or something. Uh, because they all also the, the power voters, you know, we all, the five that we have, we, we typically vote for the best interest of our citizens. And, but I think we need to figure out how can we reach the rest of them. Uh, because, you know, they always vote for their best interest, which is Metro Atlanta. And uh, some of them, they just really don't know what's going on in South Georgia. And if they do, they would vote favorably. If they know the issue, they hear a voice. Huh? So, yeah, and, and even when you uh, talk to your local rep, see who else should be here. Do we need to go to the, the house meeting there? You know, which, which rep can also help in this? So maybe send letters and educate them. Why did the next? power in numbers, there's power in your voice. We're only three people that are out here doing this, but you are, gosh, a lot more than the three of us sitting up here. So it's getting out there and educating your local elected officials on what your needs are and what you want to see 
not just relying on the one that's in your district, but it takes all of them to get something done. And the same would go for your state elected officials, um, talking to them, picking up the phone, letting them know what your concerns are, <coughs> but also not everybody knows where Valdosta is, <laughs> you know, or not everybody knows what our concerns are or what we're looking for. So reach out, educate yourselves on um, who your other maybe regional legislators are, from Penny Houston to Darlene Taylor to others that um, service our region as a whole from a South Georgia perspective because we all need one voice. So I, I'll tell you one of the things that we're doing is a regional effort with 20 other South Georgia communities to market ourselves as a place to do business. And we all have the same focus, and that is we are a great place for you to locate your business. We have workforce, we have water, we have all these things you're looking for, but we have to get out there and tell that story. And so that's what we're trying to do together. And I would say that to you to do the same thing is to talk together as well. Just another logical place to approach your legislators. The legislators are not just ours and everybody else's. They're in committees as well. You know, there's an elections committee. Amy Carter is the head of that. There's a transportation committee, which would make a very logical target for intervention. Yeah, absolutely. Great. So uh, are there any other uh, members uh, wishing to be heard, whether it's about business or any other issues? Yeah, uh, yeah. Let me, let me talk about the East West. We've heard about a lot of... First of all, we've heard a lot this evening about transportation needs and education needs. We have an opportunity to do something about the education needs right now. Yes. And that's that's what the East was. That's the education special purpose local option sales tax. This is our money that stays in our community for our children's education. This is East Blast 5. It's a continuation of the previous four East Blasts. This is a penny sales tax. Much of it is paid for, not, not by us, but by people traveling through the county down I-75. So we're collecting sales tax from, the, from them as well. What this does is to go to support both the Lowndes County and the Valdosta City Schools. This is, this is absolutely essential to the development of our, our community. What the Lowndes County School System is going to use it for is construction of a fine arts facility, a new elementary school, a high school, uh, as well as improvement in existing school buildings, equipment and furnishing facilities, acquisition of school vehicles, technology improvement, uh, security and safety equipment, textbooks and renovation of athletic facilities. What the city of Valdosta is proposing to do with the East Blast is construction of a new high school complex uh, that's over on East, East Park Avenue uh, to replace the current Valdosta High School complex, uh, as well as improvement in existing school buildings, equipping and furnishing facilities, acquisition of school vehicles, technology improvement, security and safety equipment, textbooks, uh, renovation and relocation of the central, central office complex, and acquisition of property. This, this is what keeps our school systems going. This is how we need to support our, our school systems. Early voting has already started. It's here in the Board of Elections, uh, eight, to, 8 to 5 all this week, and next week, uh, 7 a.m. to 7, 7 p.m., and then in the precincts on March 17th, uh, these elections normally have low turnout. Only 238 people voted last week, and Deb said 78 voted today. That's a record for any day so far. <laughs> so your voice and the voices of your friends can have a real impact on this issue. So please, please go ahead. This is not Chicago, so I will not say vote early and often, but please vote early. <laughs> You know, don't wait for election day. Something, something may happen. But go ahead, vote early, get out, talk to everybody you know. People at work, people at your church, people in the community, people in other organizations that you belong to. 
tell them to go out and vote for the East Blocks. This is a continuation. This is not a new tax, but this is, this is vital for the education of our children, and it's important for all of the um, workplace development that we, that we heard about tonight. Uh, this is really, really critical for our community. So please, please urge everybody you know to get out and vote for East Boston. Thank you. Do they include special education? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Dennis. Um, I would tag on that uh, and say, if you wanted to call strangers, I would um, give you a list of ten <laughs> strangers to call that you could encourage to go and vote, but it would be a thousand million times more effective if you would call ten of your friends, say, let's meet for coffee, I'll drive you to go and vote. Yeah, Jay? I don't know if this is uh, an announcement or an event, but I would like to... Uh, invite you all to join me on April the 4th at 10 o'clock in the old Dallas County Courthouse uh, where I'm going to officially kick off my campaign to be your next mayor. Uh, <laughs> the other issues that were addressed here tonight by the panel and the audience are part of my campaign platform. So uh, if you want to hear why I'm running for mayor um, and my passion for this city, uh, but I outline everything on April 4th. But I will tell you this much here: uh, you got to have vision. You got to have yes, an idea where you want to take take a group or take the people. So I'm going to outline my vision to you on April 4th and throughout this campaign. And why April 4th? I can't wait till August to get started. <laughs> <laughs> There's too much work to be done. So please, April 4th, 10 o'clock at the Old Lyons County Courthouse, um, kick off my campaign. Be your next mayor. Thank you. Yep. I'd like to make a comment. I'm Amanda Hall. I know many of y'all. I'm a local veterinarian. And at the end of January, I went in front of the Board of Commissioners to propose an anti-tethering ordinance. I know everybody knows all about it. And in the last month, three people have been bitten slash mauled by dogs that have gotten off of their tether that were properly tethered. So our commissioners are in that phase of listening to you guys, getting your comments, wanting feedback from your, the community. Um, if this is something you care about, I encourage you to call them or email them. And I'm a dog person, obviously. If you don't like dogs, that's all right. We probably won't be good friends, but um, it's a, a safety issue for our community. Um, you know, children are being mauled. We had a woman um, back in 2011 that was killed by a pit bull that had gotten off of its tether. So it's a true public safety. And we're talking about our community and making it better. Nobody wants to move into a community where it's unsafe. Thank you. I must say I can do better than that. Okay. I took a stack of the East Splash program literature to the place that I work simply because there are 120 employees and the patients also vote too. Mm -hmm. So I did better than that. Yay! <laughs> but anyway, my alumni, we are really encouraging the East Splash program. So if you have not attended the, um, oh gosh, the city council, well, anyway, I was at the meeting uh, on the 24th, and I picked up all this information. And I said, well, we got to run with this. My kids, my grandkids' lives are at stake here. I understand the transportation situation, yes. We all own our own vehicles, but we do need transportation for the people that don't have it. I agree. So how can we say that these women that are not at the bus stop with their children or with their honeys, I don't know that. Mm -hmm. Today I went to my mailbox and I saw a couple of mothers standing there waiting for the bus. And when I was raising my children, guess where I was? At my job. When the bus dropped my children off. And I do have a husband. I had a husband then and I still have one. We mm -hmm. worked. We worked. That's why we weren't at the bus stop. But trust me, we had 
the lady next door to look out for our children. So we need to kind of think along those lines too. You know, it's not all ugly. It's not all ugly. It, it's, it's, it's beautiful. It, trust me, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Life is beautiful. And we got to see other people as having a beautiful life, too. But as far as the transportation, I agree. Yes. East Flash, I agree. Yes. And this gentleman, he came up and he said something wonderful. I loved it. I loved it. But anyway, I'm going to be quiet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I still need poll workers for this election. If we're going to make it happen, I need eight more. That's how many I'm short. If you have any next door neighbors, nieces, nephews, grandkids, sisters, brothers, you're already one. Uh, 16 years old, that's all we require. They have to be available for, tra for training Saturday the 14th and then work the entire day Tuesday the 17th. But we still need eight, so send them to us. We Creating really need jobs them. already. <laughs> so paying off. If we don't get them, we're going to have to call team temps, so and that means it doubles the cost of these poll workers out of your taxes, so keep that in mind. Well, Dad, I must say, you never called me back. <coughs> never called you back? Yeah. Never. Do we have one final? Do you fill out a form? Yeah. Yes, sir. I wanted to uh, Saturday the 14th. add a comment to the statement that I made earlier. When I was analyzing the situation of where the funds went for uh, transportation in, in 2000, 2002, I also took a look at Augusta uh, versus Valdosta. Both cities are, how can I say, college towns. Augusta have the Medical College of Georgia, you have VSU, but I think that those issues alone should be added to your certificate of need to stress the fact that you need a transportation system. Thank you very much. And uh, just a final thing. Uh, Azalea Festival sign up. We still need volunteers, please. Azalea, if you want to sign up for Azalea Festival, I'll be there. Gretchen will be there, but we need more volunteers. Uh, it'll be a lot of fun, I promise. Uh, tomorrow, please show up. We got media that's going to be there, especially if you can make it about 12:30. Uh, uh, that stands. It's on the back of the agenda here. So we're doing the cash mob. We're going to spend money at a local, locally owned and operated business. Um, so there's going to be a lot of eyes on us. So we want to make a good showing. If you got anything that says Democrat on it or just wear blue, I'll be there most of the day. As well, a lot of the, the, the um, a lot of the, uh, the leaders here today. So please show up at stands tomorrow. We're also going to be doing a food drive all the way there for Second Harvest of South Georgia. So even if you just want to buy some canned goods to donate to Second Harvest, please do that as well. So we really need you to know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can bring food if, if you want, but we really need you tomorrow. So if this goes well, we're going to find another location, maybe in another couple, two or three months, and do it again. So thank you for, and once again, thank you to our, our guest speakers. April 6th, first Monday of every month. We're going to be right back here. Great people, great food. So we'll have another great speaker. Tim Carroll will be here. Possibly some other local leaders. So thank, thank you for showing up. Thank you, Madeline Hightower and the Board of Elections for hosting us. Thank you, Madeline Hightower.